we, we're a very devolved institution. And so as a consequence, technically, it's not really possible for me to know when the first e-portfolio arrived, because that would happen by an individual member of academic staff in a particular course that decided to wish to do that. I think the earliest systematic use probably goes back um, perhaps maybe 10 years in the Faculty of Medicine, as it was then, School of Medicine now. And the change in the medical curriculum and a view of the verticality of certain themes and the feed from the medical curriculum into the medical career and the idea of constant training, CPD, leads very logically to the idea of using a portfolio system and an electronic portfolio system in particular. If you go to the School of Education, they've been using portfolio type based approaches for a very long time. They were not electronic, um, but that concept of the portfolio in increasingly becoming in degrees electronic, I think has actually been around for quite a long time. The, the fact that a central, a central service exists is not, um, is not a mandate that says anybody who wishes to use ePortfolio must use this one. So in an ideal world, a central service will provide something that the majority of people find is acceptable and will use it. And I think that will probably be the case for PebblePad. But in medicine, which has its own integrated curriculum, and in the vet school that also uses a similar integrated curriculum, they have a different ePortfolio system which is built into what they do. And, and at this point, they're unlikely to step outside that and to start to use to use PebblePad. So it's a service for all for the majority of the institution, but not necessarily for, for everyone. It's a question of whether it's fit for what they want and whether it integrates with the rest of what they're doing. The, the grandiose idea of let's have an e-portfolio for the whole university and, and all students will be using it and will love it and it will, you know improve their employability and all of that. That sort of um, dream is actually very difficult to achieve and, and we went into ePortfolios at a time when there was a lot of thinking that perhaps one, these, these will be adopted easily and, 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 and will be uptaken without an enormous amount of difficulty and that wasn't true. So, so I guess that what one learns from that is that, is that grand schemes of that sort are, are, are often not very sensible. Um, and so we've been prepared to accept a much more um, piecemeal and, um, and sort of steady incremental rise in the use. Finding those courses, finding those individuals that were interested, those groups of students that were interested and working with them to build a confidence. They're a very different kind of tool, they're more disruptive and so the, the ease of adoption was harder. I'm not convinced that a single solution for an institution actually makes sense because across our, our very wide range of subjects it isn't necessarily the case that a single solution is right and one may actually need different e-portfolios for different sorts of uh, for different settings or ideally I suppose an e-portfolio that you can shape in different ways so that it can accommodate different types of educational experience and different types of, of users and learners. With ePortfolio, the question is, how are you going to support the courses, the staff and the learners to use an ePortfolio well so that it's worth their effort, the effort that it will take? And that means that you've got to have educational developers of some sort. You've got to have academic development support in sufficient quantity to be able to support the scale of what you want to do. And the experiences, I think, and looking at the experiences of others, the experiences of institutions that have tried to go university-wide on a big scale very quickly has been that they have found it very, very difficult to support the level of demand that has been has emerged as to how do I use an e-portfolio well in my programmes? How do I redesign what I do? So I think that that's the critical one. Uh, you learn from others. Uh, we always learn from others. So I think that going around a few institutions that have already doing that and, and feel that they've got some degree of success in it, you learn the lessons and then you look at your own place and decide how to apply them. But every institution is somewhat different. So generalizations from one institution to another are, are sometimes quite difficult to apply. You've got to try to estimate the scale of demand and how many staff you need to support it. But to a substantial extent, I think academics in, in, in 
in course teams learn from each other and so there is a significant amount of peer learning goes on and of course not all of the people who support academic staff and support the course teams are based in central services in a very devolved institution like this many of them are distributed so the schools have their own staff uh, there's a whole team in medicine vet medicine and and several other areas law for instance and uh, biology etc all have their local staff so the total number of people on the ground may be much, much larger than the number of people on the ground in the centre. And I think actually that's quite important because those individuals who are on the ground within the academic units are the ones who can think about how to translate this rather generic central service into local use and can disseminate the, the knowledge as to how to use it in one biology course to another, to another, to another.